Hello, my name is Lauren Layfield and this is Your Next Podcast, the show that podcast fans everywhere have been waiting for. This week, I want to tell you about one of BBC Sound's biggest hits of 2023, which is the historical true crime podcast, Lady Killers, with the incredible Lucy Worsley, who I actually met once. What that woman doesn't know about history is not worth knowing. Uh, Series 3 launched at the start of 2024 and it's just brilliant. How it works is Lucy and a team of female detectives investigate the ordinary lives and extraordinary crimes of women in the past from a contemporary feminist perspective. They join Lucy to take a look at cases including a grandmother accused of killing her grandchild in Northern Ireland, a murderous matron in Australia who targeted a young indigenous child and a middle-aged mother and tavern owner accused of conspiracy to murder a US president. You will be hooked, I guarantee it. BBC Sounds, music, radio, podcasts. Welcome back to a new series of Lady Killers with me, Lucy Worsley from BBC Radio 4. I'm once again joined by an amazing team of female detectives to reinvestigate crimes from the past. We're travelling back in time and across the world to Australia and America, as well as to Britain, to meet 19th and 20th century murderesses. In this episode, we're investigating a case known as the Bermondsey Horror. It's a story just bursting with Victorian melodrama. We've got terrible confessions... We beat him dreadfully upon the floor. We washed our hands in his crimson gore. Courtroom theatricals. History teaches us that the female is capable of reaching higher in point of virtue than the male, but that once she gives way to vice, she sinks far lower than our sex. And desperate declarations. I have not been treated like a Christian, but like a wild beast of the forest. Base, shameful England. So, loosen your stays. We are in for a thrilling ride. I'm Lucy Worsley, and I'm back with a new series of Lady Killers, where true crime meets history with a twist. We are re-examining the wild and unthinkable crimes of women from more than 100 years ago. These are often quite ordinary women who committed extraordinary acts. We hear their voices, their words, and we ask, is life so very different for women today? This time, we've a truly sensational story to tell. I'm so pleased to be joined by someone who knows everything there is to know about intrigue and suspense. She is a number one best-selling novelist and the founder director of the Women's Prize for Fiction. Most recently, she's brought us The Ghost Ship, the latest novel in her celebrated Joubert Family Chronicles, and the non-fiction book Warrior Queens and Quiet Revolutionaries, How Women Also Built the World. It's Kate Moss. Hello, lovely to be here. Welcome, Kate. I'm so glad that you are our guest detective today because things are going to get very dark very quickly. Right up my street. The year is 1849. We're in Bermondsey, just south of the Thames in London, where two policemen are searching for a man named Patrick O'Connor. He's a customs officer who's gone missing. He was last seen walking towards number three, Miniver Place. The police have searched the house. They've even dug up the garden. They're just about to give up when one officer notices something a bit funny about two of the flagstones in the kitchen floor. The two stones appear to have been recently removed. I proceeded to remove a portion of the earth. When I got down about a foot, I discovered the toe of a man. And when I got about 18 inches down, I discovered the loins of a man and the back of a man. It was lying on the belly and the legs were brought back and tied up round the haunches with a strong cord. It was quite naked. Gruesome. What 
on earth is going on here? I went to London with our in-house historian, Professor Rosalind Crone from the Open University, to find out more. Ros, this is a highly desirable neighbourhood now, but what was it like in 1849? definitely less desirable than it is today. Bermondsey then is the centre of the leather trade. And if you can imagine, Lucy, there are tanneries all around us pumping their noxious waste into the open sewers, all of it draining out into the Thames. So imagine the stench coming up. That made the population here very vulnerable to disease. And at the time we're talking about the summer of 1849, there is a cholera epidemic raging through London and hitting its peak in Bermondsey. We're here because the house where the body was found stood just the other side of this wall. Yes, and I brought you a picture of the discovery, Lucy, an artistic representation. You see the policemen here and they're finding... Are those the little toes They're the little out? toes sticking out of the lime. <laughs> it was buried in quicklime, so they obviously wanted it to decompose quite quickly. This is no ordinary murder scene. This is more like some kind of gangland killing. Gosh. And who had been living in Free Minerva Place at the time? A couple. Maria and Frederick Manning. She was actually Swiss and she had come over to England and worked as a lady's maid for a while, uh, most recently for the daughter of the Duchess of Sutherland. This is very Downton Abbey. I like this. Yeah. Now, when she was working as a lady's maid, she met a man called Frederick Manning. They had a relationship and they decided to get married in 1847. He was a guard on the Great Western Railway, but he lost his job because they suspected him of being involved in train robberies. And what was unusual about their domestic setup? Well, they had this friend, this constant visitor called Patrick O'Connor. He was a man that Maria also met while she was working as a lady's maid and they had some kind of relationship. That relationship continued after her marriage to Frederick. And this Patrick was a constant visitor to the house and she was a constant visitor to his lodgings on an almost daily basis. And he was a bit shady as well. It was likely that he was involved in things like fraud and usury. This is quite unlike our idea of Victorian life. You've got a married couple and a third party and they're in a sort of open threesome together. Yeah, it's, it's a menage a trois. Yeah? Yeah. Gosh. <laughs> Gosh, indeed. <laughs> Blimey. A Victorian menage a trois. Kate, I think this has the makings of a great thriller. What do you think? Oh, it's fantastic. I mean, firstly, the title, Bermondsey Horror, but also the idea that it was kind of hidden in plain sight that there was this three-way relationship going on. Yes. That everybody was a little bit dodgy and they're in that part of London, which, of course, as you say, has become terribly shishi now. But it was, you know, a, a nest of vipers. Hmm. It's all very dark and sinister, isn't it? Would you describe this as gothic? Gothic fiction has a very particular form. And if you like, it is the sense of there will always be an innocent, although O'Connor is hardly innocent in this case, but it's the balance between light and dark, between moral and immoral people. The idea that beneath the surface, everything is somehow putrefying and falling to pieces. You always have darkness, you always have mysterious streets, you always have dirt and grime. And the resolution will be about essentially the light being shone in. And so everything about this story, I mean, it's made for a gothic thriller. Fabulous. I'm also quite interested in this new 19th century phenomenon of enjoying true crime. There's a famous essay comes out in 1827 by Thomas de Quincey called On Murder as Considered as One of the Fine Arts. And it's kind of a founding manifesto for true crime podcast makers because <laughs> it talks about the British as a nation of murder fanciers, as connoisseurs in murder. How does that make us feel? What do we really think about this phenomenon, enjoying other people's misfortune? Well, it's never gone away. Mm. I think it's because there is resolution in crime. The real world is messy and complicated and we're not necessarily in charge of what happens to us. When you read a crime story, even if it's a true crime story, it sounds like it's, if you like, almost pornographic and salacious to be reveling in others' misfortunes. But think of it this way. There's a problem. Something happens. They're caught there is resolution. You can step away. You have power over that story. And it's your relationship with the story. You don't have to go any further than you want to. I mean, it was the great Edith Wharton, the great American writer. She talked about the thrill of the shudder. And I think there is an element of truth in that, the thrill of the shudder. <laughs> Thank you.
and there's plenty to make us shudder back in Bermondsey in August 1849. The police have found this corpse, but how can they be sure it's Patrick O'Connor? The answer is his dentures. I'm a dentist. I knew Patrick O'Connor, the deceased, as a patient. Well, I sold this set of false teeth to him. So, Mr. Patrick O'Connor has been found. And there's more. Someone has also been to his lodgings and stolen a considerable amount of money and some valuable share certificates. An inquest finds that O'Connor was shot just above the right eye and finished off with blows to the head done by a heavy implement. And free men of a place, the scene of the crime, is deserted. The residents, Patrick's lover, Maria Manning, and her husband, Frederick, have scarpered. The Mannings quickly become prime suspects. Evidence mounts against them. The police discover that in the weeks leading up to O'Connor's death, the couple have been on rather an incriminating shopping spree. They've bought a crowbar, a heavy shovel, and a large amount of quicklime. Hmm. They've also been asking their lodger, a medical student, some highly suspicious questions. He once asked me what part of the head was most vital or tender, where the brain was placed, whether I thought a murderer went to heaven. Now, you don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to work out that this makes the Mannings look pretty guilty. These events would ultimately be retold in popular verse. We premeditated to take his life. To our home invited him one Thursday night. The murderous weapons we had prepared and we trepanned him into a fatal snare. She's so fabulously sinister. The police grow desperate to find Maria and Frederick. They send wanted posters out to the ports and to the railway stations across the country. These posters describe Maria as 30 years old, five feet seven inches tall and stout. She has a fresh complexion, she's got long dark hair, and she is good looking. The police follow up loads of false leads. They even stop a steamship on its way to New York, only to find a different family called Manning on board. It looks like Maria and Frederick might get away with murder, until one Bobby on the beat strikes it lucky. Roz and I are back on the case. There's good old-fashioned shoe leather policing going on and one of the detectives, Sergeant Shaw, manages to track down a cab driver who says he remembers that he picked up a lady answering this description from 3 Minerva Place on 13th of August in the afternoon and she had with her three large boxes and a carpet bag. She asked him to take her to London Bridge Station. Let's do the same thing, shall we? Let's follow her. Yeah, let's go. Taxi? If you've got any money, Ross, you might have to pay. <laughs> Ross and I are off across London. We're retracing Maria's footsteps. Could we go to London Bridge Station, please? Sure, well, London Bridge it is. Maria takes a horse-drawn hackney cab. She stops on the way to the station to buy some white cards to use as luggage labels. She writes on them, Mrs Smith passenger to Paris, to be left until called for. It's not the most imaginative false name in the world to use, is it? But there we go. She labels two of her boxes and leaves them with the porter at London Bridge Station. Oh, hello. Uh, can I leave this luggage with you? Yes, no problem. Great, thanks. Roz, what was in those boxes that Mrs Smith checked into the left luggage then? Oh, that's a really good question, Lucy. And the police, following the evidence of the cab driver, come here, open the boxes, and they create an itemised list, <gasps> which I have with me. It's an awful lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's a huge <laughs> amount of stuff. So if you look down here, you can see things like 11 petticoats. Yes. Uh, 28 pairs of stockings up there. A teapot. Life's Essentials. Life's Essentials. Also a dress and several other pieces of fabric stained with blood. Ooh. Blood-stained clothing. It looks to me like all the essentials you need to start a new life somewhere else. Also, maybe it's a good idea to keep the evidence with you rather than leaving it lying around. Mm-hmm. So we know what's happened to the luggage. What has happened to Mrs Maria Manning? 
Well, Lucy, it's back to the cab and onwards to Euston Station. The chase continues. I'm really getting into this now. Hello. Hi, how's it going? Good, thanks. First class ticket to Edinburgh, please. Would there be a single or return? Oh, definitely a single. OK, no problem. I'm not coming back. So it turns out that Maria has bought herself a first class single to Edinburgh. What's yep. her plan? That's right, Lucy. We're here at Euston Station, the first intercity railway station built in London. She's leaving the scene of the crime and she's leaving her husband. Mm, I wonder if she's going to get away with it. It's a cliffhanger. It is, isn't it? So Maria is off to Scotland. What about Frederick? Well, he is shocked to realise that his wife has double-crossed him and run off. And she's taken with her Patrick O'Connor's cash and his share certificates too. Frederick now panics. He plans to go to Australia, but he doesn't have enough money and he only gets as far as the Channel Islands. So, Kate, on the one hand, we've got Maria, who's super well organised, and on the other, we've got Frederick, who seems pretty useless. Maria isn't a martyr, is she? She's the heroine of her own story. I wouldn't say heroine necessarily, but I would say she was the protagonist of her own story, absolutely. She is clearly the moving brain of this, without a doubt. This isn't really what we expect from a Victorian woman, is it? It's not respectable. There certainly is this kind of myth in Victorian England. I blame Coventry Patmore, who of course wrote the very famous and influential poem, The Angel in the House, which he began in 1854. And I tell you what, it wasn't in women's favour. The idea that women should be quiet, ministering, silent, always very subject to their husband's views, they don't speak, you know, they're not the leader of the marriage. That's never been true, but that was the writing that started to come in the Victorian era. And of course, for most women, they didn't have any choice. So the papers, Kate, are going to make a really big thing about Maria's appearance. She wears this trademark black satin dress. I would say a lot of this is that people think she's above her station, that because she was a lady's maid, she's behaving like a lady. And that's the one thing that is unforgivable, particularly because she's not English. I think she's wearing her mistress's clothes in a sort of really deep sense. Isn't in a deep she? sense, yes, <laughs> absolutely. And so that's the other thing that's not feminine, that she's taking too much upon herself. She's removing herself from the place that she should be in society and acting in a very confident and visible way. And that's not seen as feminine. And it's also that fear, isn't it? And, you know, we'll see that later in the century with particularly Henry James, the turn of the screw, the idea that the people you employ to look after you Maybe you've just let the devil into your house. So the idea that the maid could be the murderer, this is undermining everything about Victorian society. Well, the Mannings are by now notorious. And the papers called Maria, I really love this, the Lady Macbeth of Bermondsey. But she can't remain on the run forever. In Edinburgh, Maria is still posing as Mrs Smith. But her cover gets blown when she goes into a stockbroker's with O'Connor's share certificates. This stockbroker has been alerted to the fact that these particular certificates have been stolen and he reports Maria to the police. Hmm. Useless Frederick is also arrested in Jersey and both husband and wife are brought back to London to await trial. Justice pursued me without delay and I was taken upon that fatal day. Their trial begins on the 26th of October 1849 at the Old Bailey. This is an unmissable event. Maria's barrister says that Frederick was the ringleader and indeed the killer. But Frederick's barrister tells rather a different story. History teaches us that the female is capable of reaching higher in point of virtue than the male. But that once she gives way to vice, she sinks far lower than our sex. My hypothesis, then, is that the female prisoner Manning premeditated, planned, and concocted the murder, and that she made her husband her dupe and instrument for that purpose. But the jury return a swift and decisive verdict. For both husband and wife, it's going to be guilty. Maria has shown no emotion this far, but now, as the verdict is delivered, she's furious. My lord, I have been treated most cruelly in this country. 
I am a foreigner, and I have been denied justice. I have not been treated like a Christian, but like a wild beast of the forest. If I wish to take anybody's life, why should I not take that of my husband, who is the greatest enemy to me in the world? Why should I kill Mr. O'Connor? He was my best friend. Base. Shameful England. It's too late for all this sort of thing. Maria and Frederick are sentenced to death. The date of the execution is set for the 13th of November, 1849. It will be a huge public spectacle for Londoners. Ros Crone and I went along to see why. Ros, we're here in a South London park. We've got basketball courts, plane trees. It's all pretty peaceful. But that wasn't the case in 1849, was it? No, if you can imagine that people started pouring into this area the night before. We're talking about 30,000, maybe even 50,000 spectators turning up, uh, having fun, a bit of a festival atmosphere going on, waiting for the criminals to be brought out in the morning, first thing, to be executed on the roof of the prison. That's like a kind of stage set then. They're lifted up above all of these people. Everyone can see them dying. Yeah, that's right. There's a real theatrical kind of element to execution at this time. Newgate Jail is the same, where they have a kind of protruding stage and people gathering around it to see. It's the idea of the performance of justice and kind of catharsis, giving the public a sense that justice has been done. There was merchandising, wasn't there, Ros? Yeah, if you can imagine, amongst the crowd here were what we call patterers or broadside sellers. And I've got a picture of some of their wares to show you here. These are sort of proto-newspapers. Yeah, they're very, very cheap to print and also very decorative. So here, you see, you get the scene of the execution, an account of the trial. You get the confession of yes. one of the murderers. That's Frederick's confession there. You get a little picture of what's going on in his condemned cell just oh, before the execution. Oh, it's the last interview with his sister. Yeah. And you, his sister's crying. It's very, very moving. People take it away as a souvenir. It's a memento. Some people would even hang it in their drawing room or, or their kitchen, like posters. And after the execution, the patterers would fold them up in such a way that they could then be sold on as books. We have an estimate that about two and a half million of these were sold just on the Mannings. The Mannings? Yeah, that's just an estimate. Wow. I think probably it was many more. Maria is everywhere. Her waxwork is displayed in Madame Tussaud's Chamber of Horrors. It's there for over 100 years, right up to the 1970s. But back to the execution. On the morning of her hanging, Maria Manning requests a new pair of silk stockings to wear. And on the scaffold, she retains her dignity to the end. The spectators include the novelist Charles Dickens. He pays two guineas to get a seat with a good view. He is appalled by the crowd's raucous behaviour, but he's rather fascinated by Maria herself. A fine shape, so elaborately corseted and artfully dressed that it was quite unchanged in its trim appearance as it swung slowly from side to side. That's really creepy of you, Dickens. He will go on to reimagine Maria in his fiction. In his novel Bleak House, he'll give some of her attributes, spoiler alert, to a murderous lady's maid called Hortons. Back in our studio, his Ros come to join us, Kate. Hello. Hi, Kate. Now, I am struck, Kate, by just how theatrical all that stuff was at the jail. It's, it's really powerful, it's isn't it? It's fantastic. I mean, it's awful, obviously, because two people died horribly. But it is also fantastic that she is so poised and she walks wonderfully. And it will be a party atmosphere until the moment that they walk up onto the scaffold. And then you could just imagine this massive crowd, thousands of people falling silent. The further back in the past these things are, the easier it is to imagine them as dramatic spectacles and sort of theatrical and yes. something a bit filmic about it. Yeah, yeah. If that was happening today, we would find it incredibly distasteful. No, no, absolutely. Absolutely. That's the thing. But it, it was different then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there used to have been a lot of hangings and then the laws were changed and you were only left with treason and murder. So actually the crowd had been denied a lot of these public spectacles and the debate is already, well, it's going to start, isn't it, about whether they should be public or not. And Ros, that verse we've been hearing throughout this story, tell us a bit about that. That's one of the ballads, right? 
Yes, we've heard the verses spoken, but these verses were actually put to the tune of a popular ballad, and they were printed on the execution broadsides and sung in the streets by the hawkers and also the buyers. They're very crude songs. They're often just written by one of the hacks who was employed by the printer. Mm. What's so incredible about it is that already the way that she chose to die and the things she said are being changed by other people into something completely different. Nothing of what actually happened there. So already she's becoming a legendary mythical figure. That's exactly right. What you've got to remember about these broadsides as well, they are printed before the execution day. Yeah. So all of this is done before the hanging actually takes place. And so the description you get along the side of the hanging day itself, in some respects, it's fiction. It's really hard for us to know who she really was. It's impossible to know who anyone is if they don't write their own story because there will always be an agenda. There will always be somebody representing what they think the person was like or using a character such as Maria Manning to make a moral message, to say that this is what happens when you have confident women who take charge. The thing I liked about this story, and and this is going to sound daft, but so many women who kill obviously have killed because... Something awful's happened to them. They've had no choice or it's self-defence or they are victims in some way or another. What is, I think, unusual about Maria Manning is that there is purpose and determination and agency. And I think that's why her story is told so many times. And of course, every time it's retold, she becomes somebody else again. You've written a lot about remarkable women who've been missed out of conventional histories. Do you think that we should include bad ones as well as goodies? I really do. History, if it's only half the population, if it's only men, isn't history at all. And we cannot put women into history on the basis of likability. We've got to have the courage to put all the women back, the sinners and the saints, because that's what we do with men. We've got to put the monstrous women back too. It's got to be everybody. So, let's think about this then. On a practical level, Maria Manning can give us a few pointers on how not to commit a murder. Don't leave blood-stained cloves in the left luggage at a London railway station. (laughs) Don't leave the false teeth in your victim's mouth. But while, of course, we can't condone bashing your lover on the head and burying him under the kitchen floor, it does seem to me that Maria was also punished for having had a lover in the first place, for being sexually voracious for looking too good in her black satin dresses and also, I think, for being Swiss. And she has undeniably left a legacy. Partly inspired by her case, Dickens and others argued hard to end what they saw as the shameful practice of public execution. It got abolished in 1868. And Dickens recreated the hunt for Maria in Bleak House, which is actually an early version of a detective story with the police as heroes, like so many others to follow. There's something so compelling about Maria Manning. I have to admit that she's one of my favourite Victorian murderesses. She was a criminal, it's true, but she was also an extraordinary woman. A huge thank you to our guest detective and inspirational storyteller, Kate Moss, and to our wonderful in-house historian, Professor Rosalind Crone. Next time on Lady Killers, a matron is accused of shocking cruelty at a residential mission school for First Nation children in Queensland, Australia. Lady Killers with Lucy Worsley was produced by Sarah Goodman and the readers, Amina Ryan and Jonathan Keeble. Sound design is by Chris McLean, and the series producer is Julia Habel. It's a Story Hunter production for BBC Radio 4. And you can catch up with the whole series if you search for Lady Killers on BBC Sounds. What can the Lady Killers cases teach us about the authenticity of women's stories? The Open University takes a look at how we can reclaim female voices from history. Go to bbc.co.uk and search for Lady Killers, where you can follow the links too. The Open University. I'm Helena Bonham Carter, and for BBC Radio 4, this is History's Secret Heroes. She received a brown envelope and says, Do not open it until you get on the plane. A series of rarely heard tales from World War II. They knew they were going to be caught, and actually that was sort of part of the plan. Unsung heroes 
acts of resistance, deception and courage. That is a morning that is seared into my memory. I will never be able to forget the terror of that morning. Subscribe to History's Secret Heroes on BBC Sounds. Follow Lady Killers on BBC Sounds and don't forget there's a chunky back catalogue to get stuck into too. Once you've tapped follow, make sure you do the same for this show too so you can find your next podcast. All my recommendations from the whole series will also be on Podcast Rex at www.podcastrex.com That is www.podcastrex.com Listener.